Hey everybody, today we are talking about uh, how much salt do we need? And uh, continuing the series where I'm just going to go live and take a question from social media or on my forums today, this is a question that comes from the Vitamins and Minerals 101 Premium Forum, which is a forum that's within my site if you're logged in, uh, that anyone has access to if they've pre-ordered the Vitamins and Minerals 101 book. Uh, which you can do at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash book, or uh, if they're a MasterPass member, which you can sign up for at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash MasterPass. Um, I'm not a doctor. None of this is medical advice. And see the description or the chat for ways that you can support me. Um, and with all that said, let's move on to the question. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so this question is in the Vitamins and Minerals 101 Premium Form. It comes from Edwin Alba, and he says, In looking into Rob Wolf's LMNT electrolyte mix, I came across the suggestion that we should be consuming closer to 5 grams of salt per day. This is obviously more than double what is recommended. Curious to hear your thoughts on this. And then Mike adds a comment and says, I just finished reading Dr. James Nic uh, DiNicolatonio's book. I don't know. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but uh, Dr. James' book, The Salt Fix, which reads like a published paper defending a higher sodium intake. To make a long story short, he recommends you salt your food to taste. If you're looking into numerical specifics, he st states that most adults would want in the ballpark of four to six grams of sodium per day. That's about 10 grams of salt. He recommends Redmond Real Salt and can be divided by 2.5 and equals about four grams of sodium. Uh, so that's referencing the fact that salt is sodium chloride and only a portion of sodium chloride is actually sodium so if you're talking about grams of salt then any given number of grams of salt as if you measured it in table salt is a smaller number of grams of sodium and so uh it, on a practical level this is me talking on a practical level when you're talking about uh measuring salt you're probably measuring the actual table salt um Whereas, you know, a teaspoon of salt is a teaspoon of sodium chloride. Um, 10 grams of salt is 10 grams of sodium chloride. Uh, but if you're looking at um, nutritional requirements or recommendations from the Institute of Medicine or on a food label, uh, you're going to be talking about grams of sodium or milligrams of sodium. And if you see sodium listed on a food label, you're talking about the sodium. Uh, so if you want to translate between those, it's roughly... Um, roughly met, multiply the sodium by 2.5 to get the salt or divide the salt by two and a half to get the sodium. Going back to Mike's comment, he says, so your stated five grams of salt per day is roughly two grams of sodium, which is still much lower than James's estimate of four to six grams. My diet, for example, contains 1500 milligrams of sodium per day. And if you add two grams of sodium or five grams of salt, you're actually in the same ballpark as James's lower bound for the recommended amounts. Currently, I'm trying to figure out why my diastolic reading is low. I read that too much salt can decrease the elasticity of your blood vessels. So I've been trying to lower my very high salt intake to see if it changes. What's concerning is my systolic number lowered as a result. I currently feel my personal dietary sodium intake should be around three and a half grams and not the six or more I was likely getting. I'm fairly fit athlete with more muscle tone than I need and do cardio three times a week. I think my blood pressure is just naturally low. In any case, what's likely more important is if you're taking these sodium intakes seriously, is that you get a higher potassium count. Um, so I am going to tackle Mike's addition, but I want to go back to Edwin's original question, much shorter, which is basically Rob Wolf saying we need five grams of salt per day, uh, or rather on the LMNT page, uh, it's arguing that this is obviously more than double what's recommended. And by recommended, he's talking about the uh, 1500 milligrams recommended by the uh, Institute of Medicine slash, which has become the National Academy of Medicine, uh, which recently, the most recent uh, DRIs, uh, which are the um, uh, dietary reference intakes, sorry. <laughs> um, the most recent, so RDAs, for example, uh, are included in the D DRIs, but the DRI more broadly includes adequate intakes when they don't have enough evidence for an RDA, uh, or it includes tolerable upper intake levels. 
uh, which is the maximum of something you should consume outside of medical supervision. Uh, but now with the release of the, I, I believe it was 2019, they came out with the new sodium and potassium DRIs. The first ones they've come out with since uh, sodium, uh, excuse me, since calcium and vitamin D were revisited in 2010. Um, these new ones, they've added new types of DRIs, which include now the chronic uh, CDRR, I think it is. Let me see if I have this right. Uh, CDRR, which is uh, chronic dietary, uh, no, chronic disease reduction. What does it stand for? Hold on one second. Um, chronic risk reduction intake. Is that right? It's got to be chronic dietary risk reduction intake, something like that. Anyway, uh, CDRR is um, basically the amount that you should limit to. So tolerable upper intake level or TYL was the amount that you should limit to to avoid any risk of toxicity. The CDRR, they're basically... So with the new DRIs, they're moving in the direction, number one, of going more towards evidence-based medicine standards of you need a clinical, um, a clinic, and you need large-scale RCTs with clinical events to justify making um, a, an RDA on a health endpoint. Uh, but they're also moving more towards preventative medicine, where they're saying, well, we don't just want to avoid toxicity. Um, we also want to avoid chronic disease risk. And so the CDRR is the amount that you should avoid in order to reduce your risk of chronic disease. Now, I, I think their application of these ideas should be subject to really strong criticisms. Um, and my criticism would be that, you know, one of the things that, that basically came out of this is um, there is no RDA for sodium or potassium. There's just adequate intakes. Um, but they made a chronic diet, the, uh, CDRR for sodium, and they did not make one for potassium. And the reason they made one for sodium is that they had RCTs of sodium on, on actual heart disease events, whereas um, they made no CDRR for potassium, even though potassium lowers blood pressure, because uh, all the potassium trials like, on blood pressure were designed to look at, if you consume a given amount of potassium, how much uh, does it lower your blood pressure? rather than uh, ha what, if, what is the size of the effect in reducing the incidence of hypertension? And so I think this is utterly ridiculous. If you go back to the um, DRIs from 2005, potassium was 4.7 grams, and they've now reduced it um, to, um, depending on age and sex, to somewhere around 2 to 3 grams. And the reason that they've done that is that they've used they've said, we're going to raise our standard of evidence. We're going to use evidence-based medicine standards, and we want a clinical endpoint. And so all these trials of showing that potassium reduces blood pressure were completely dismissed because none of those trials were designed to show that it reduced the incidence of hypertension. So hypertension diagnosis is a clinical endpoint, but blood pressure is not. And so I think it's preposterous that they basically imposed this new standard when had they made that standard 20 years ago, all those trials would have been done with, you know, calculated as how do we reduce the incidence of hypertension? Um, so it's, it's, I understand that we want that standard of evidence going forward, but to revise, to basically cut the potassium adequate intake in half by imposing this new standard on evidence from 20 or 30 years ago, is just strikes me as absurd. And it's particularly absurd because the AI in 2005 of 4.7 grams was based on, um, was, was based on the fact that potassium at 4.7 grams is able to totally abolish the rise in blood pressure that occurs in salt sensitive hypertension. And so the old AI from 2005 for sodium and potassium explicitly acknowledge the relationship between the two, which is that there is no harmful effect of sodium on blood pressure if you have enough potassium. But because there were no potassium 
uh, trials reducing hypertension diagnosis thresholds. All of that is now thrown in the trash. All that evidence is totally ignored um, and just thrown in the trash. And because there are trials of sodium reduced diets in reducing uh, heart disease risk, um, now we can say you need to limit sodium to 1500 milligram uh, to um, the CDRR is um, limit it to 2300 milligrams uh, per day or below. So basically the, the current DRIs are saying you need to keep your sodium between 1500 milligrams a day and 2300 milligrams a day in order to not have um, risk of deficiency on one hand, although they're not even saying that because it's an adequate intake. So they're saying, well, we don't really know what you, you know, if anyone can be deficient, but we know that 1500 milligrams per day or more is consistent with decent health. And we know we don't want to go over 2300 milligrams, which is sort of a ridiculously small window. Um, but they've totally thrown the principle that potassium uh, abolishes the risk of hypertension from sodium, just thrown it in the trash, even though it's a true physiological principle justified with randomized controlled trials. Um, so I, I actually think that like the standard of evidence-based medicine um, is good. We want to move in that direction. And the standard of uh, preventing chronic disease is good. We want to move in that direction. But the way that they've applied it to just throw decades of research in the trash, throw the physiological principle in the trash, throw the interactive relationship between these two nutrients in the trash, because we are going to put blinders on and ignore anything that was done for the last decades that doesn't fit within this new framework of evidence-based medicine on clinical endpoints. I think that's nuts. Um, anyway, that's my rant. Um, so, um, okay. So now I'll answer the question. Um, and of course, if you have, uh, follow-ups that are highly relevant to this, please put them in the chat. Uh, and at the end of this, I'll try to address, um, any highly relevant questions that come up. Okay. So the original question is, um, should we be consuming more than, uh, closer to five grams of salt per day or, uh, or should we be consuming, you know, more what's recommended in the 1500 to 2300 milligram range or 1.5 to 2.3 grams per day range? I guess my short answer to this is, um, and this is something that uh, Mike had, had added uh, in his follow-up comment is, um, well, I'd go further than what Mike said. So Mike said, you know, if you're going to go to the high so sodium intake, it's important to raise your potassium. Um, I guess what I would say is that <clears throat> is that um, the exact amount you need is highly dependent on many different contextual factors, and uh, it's very reasonable. You know, anything between um, fifteen hundred milligrams and uh, five to six grams is is quite reasonable. Um, but I do think as uh, Mike was saying, Dr. James covers in the salt fix that you should focus on um, your cravings for salt, salt your food to taste. I do think that is a very important principle. Um, but I, I also think that um, A, this is mostly about the balance between sodium and potassium. Um, and B, I think what you want to do is make sure that you avoid um, any of the things that emerge um, as deficiency signs and any of the things that emerge as sodium potassium imbalance signs. Um, so one of the things that the uh, National Academy of Medicine considered when they were setting the uh, sodium the sodium and potassium DRIs, and particularly when looking at the adequate intake for sodium, was, uh, is it safe to restrict sodium to 1,500 milligrams per day? Now, the 1,500 milligrams per day, you know, the funny thing is usually an AI or an adequate intake 
is set based on what are what is the population of apparently healthy people consuming on average and they'll take the mean or the median of population intakes from people that appear to be healthy and they'll say well this mean or median intake of this nutrient is consistent with apparent health and therefore we're going to use this as the ai they didn't do that and the reason they didn't do that is because the chronic uh the cdrr so the chronic uh disease Re, uh, reduction amount was set at 2300 milligrams based on low so uh, dietary sodium restriction trials reducing the risk of heart disease uh, when the median intakes in the population are about 3000 milligrams so they basically they couldn't set the adequate intake based on the mean of the population and so they had to use the actual amount being, you know, the actual target from uh, trials that where they were trying to reduce sodium intake to reduce the risk of heart disease. So they basically used the target of the sodium restriction trials as the adequate intake. Um, now, when they considered whether it was safe to restrict sodium from the population mean of 3,000 milligrams per day to 1,500 milligrams per day, they said that there was no consistent pattern of adverse effects in human trials when they dropped sodium that low. But if you look at the trials that they cited, there was a general tendency in these trials for about 10 to 15% of people to report fatigue, weakness, dizziness, or diarrhea on low sodium intakes. Conversely, there was a general tendency for people to report headaches when they had high sodium intakes. Generally, trials where a high sodium intake led to a certain proportion of people reporting a headache. What sodium was brought up to around five or six grams per day. So I'm going, you know, I'm generally thinking uh, probably 1500 milligrams per day is generally safe for a significant number of people. But if you are feeling fatigued, weak, dizzy, or get diarrhea on sodium intakes that low, um, then you know, you're probably not a good candidate for dropping your sodium down to 1500 milligrams per day. Uh, conversely, if you are suffering from fatigue, if you're more tired than you feel you should be, or you feel weak, or sometimes you feel dizzy, or sometimes you get diarrhea, uh, you might want to look at increasing your sodium intake. Um, conversely, if you're getting a, a headache, I'm going to guess that headaches are reported on high sodium intakes largely because of high blood pressure effects. But you can actually measure that at home. So if when you bring your sodium up to five or six grams per day and you get headaches from it, um, you should probably see if it's rising your blood pressure. And um, if that's the case, then you you know you could consider reducing your sodium intake from there, or you could consider beefing your potassium up, which is what Mike had uh, said in the forum in in response to Edwin. Um, and. It, in that case, you should consider the most plausible potassium intake to go up to, to be 4,700 milligrams per day, because this is what the 2005 uh, DRIs were set based on when they said uh, 4.7 grams per day of potassium should be, uh, should be what the adequate intake. That was based on a trial showing that some people needed up to 4,700 milligrams of potassium per day in order to abolish the increase in hypertension, uh, the increase in blood pressure that otherwise came from increasing their salt. Um, so a couple other things that are worth um, that are worth considering here are if you look at uh, some papers that have been published on trying to estimate what hunter gatherer intakes were, they've concluded by looking at taking a um, so Lauren Cordain uh, I, and um, I'm blanking on his name, Eaton, uh, Boyd Eaton, uh, had published a paper. And Linda Frasetto, who's done some paleo research at, uh, I believe, uh, UCSF, University of California, San Francisco. Um, she's done uh, a more recent uh, review of how much potassium should we be eating, where she was citing. Uh, Cordain and Eaton on this. They basically selected some hunter-gatherer diets and they tried to estimate what their sodium and potassium intakes would be. 
And so they estimate that the potass the sodium intake would be 700 milligrams per day and the potassium intake would be um would be 11 grams per day. But one of the things that's really important to consider about that is, you know, first of all, obviously the range of hunter gatherer diets includes uh arctic diets where plant intakes were very low, not just equatorial diets where the plant intakes were very high. Um and I think the potassium intake in an Arctic diet is going to be considerably lower, although animal foods do uh, contain potassium. But also, um, if you just adding salt to the diet is totally normal and totally natural. So animals in the wild have been consistently observed to find out sources of natural salt licks. Farmers provide salt licks to their animals, and it's highly unlikely that hunter-gatherer groups did not seek out sources of added salt like wild animals do um, and like current humans do and like farmed animals do. And so it's seeking out salt in addition to whole foods is totally normal and observed across uh, the spectrum of uh, humans and animals in nature. Um, so I really doubt that the ancestral sodium intake is only 700 milligrams per day. Uh, the other thing is if you're just looking at, you know, how do you minimize the risk of headaches, dizziness, diarrhea, weakness, and fatigue, it's probably to keep your sodium intake, um, you know, closer to the population median of 3000 milligrams per day. And you can probably avoid the risk of blood pressure, headache, and anything else adverse that comes by keeping your potassium intake up to an absolute minimum of the, um, so the potassium AI, I guess I would use as the absolute lower bound. Um, and for adults, this is basically uh, 2,300 to 20, uh, well, actually for, for women, it's 2.6 grams per day, a little bit higher for pregnancy. And for men, it's 3.4 grams per day. Uh, so I would use this 2.6 for women, 3.4 grams for men as the absolute bottom of potassium intake. And I would say that, you know, what you want ideally is, you know, the upper bound might be somewhere between the 4.7 grams that abolishes salt sensitive hypertension and, um, and the 11 grams that was estimated ancestrally. And so I think keeping somewhere in that range is is probably where you want most of the time. Um, but, you know, if you experience, if you're more tired or you just feel kind of down, um, it's very plausible that sodium uh, would would help, that more sodium would help. And so I think it's totally reasonable to try to go up into the five to six grams of sodium range if it doesn't increase your blood pressure and if it makes you feel better. So I think I, I think this is very contextual on, um, I, I would say, the, so to reiterate, I think the range of, of sodium intakes that should be considered should be 1500 milligrams at the absolute bottom and five to six grams at the upper bound with most people probably doing best if they're somewhere around the population median of three grams and if they're largely obeying their taste for salt. Um, and the uh, any adverse effects experienced towards the upper end of that range will probably be resolved if you are consuming a good amount of potassium, which I would put at 2.6 for women and 3.4 grams for men at the um, lower bound of the range and 4.7 grams as kind of the middle of that range and anything up to 11 grams as a plausible upper bound of that range. Um, but I, I think these are there's a lot of things that you can just measure at home. So if your blood pressure is great on your current salt intake, you probably don't need to reduce your blood pressure. Um, there is plausible mechanisms by which too much salt, especially in relation to potassium, could 
uh, hurt your bone health or your kidney health. And uh, I think Linda Frasetto has made this argument the best. Um, and so just so for people who want the um, references to this, let me just try to pull it up on PubMed real quick. Uh, so I'm searching PubMed for Frasetto potassium. And uh, okay, let me share my screen real quick. So uh, this right here is the paper that I was talking about. It's um, Linda Frasetto is the first author, and it's called Metabolic and Physiological Improvements from Consuming a Paleolithic. Well, actually, no, wait, I don't think this is the right paper. That is one of her papers, and it would probably be useful. Um, is this it? Uh, let me see. I don't think this is it either. Let me um, let me put a filter on for review. Okay, uh, I think these are some of the papers that would be good to look at for Linda Frasetto's perspective. So the evolution informed optimal dietary potassium intake of human beings greatly exceeds current and recommended intakes. Um, and I, I believe this is an older and more technical paper, Diet Evolution and Aging, the Pathophysiological Effects of the Post-Agricultural Inversion of the Potassium to Sodium and Base to Chloride Ratios in the Human Diet. Um, so check out the... Um, so if you want to find those papers, just put Frasetto into PubMed, uh, Frasetto Potassium Limit to Reviews, and those will be at the top. Uh, First, more recent paper is more of big picture, and um, and the second paper is much more technical and a little older from two thousand one. Um, but I, you know, I so I'm pretty familiar with her arguments around the sodium potassium ratio, and I don't I don't see any basis from those for being worried about the the um, the effect of potassium excuse me, the, the effect of the sodium to potassium ratio on your bone health or your kidney health if you are keeping your blood pressure in the optimal range. So um, I think if your blood pressure looks great on your current sodium potassium intake, uh, it that's probably a great indicator that your bone health and your kidney health is also going to be optimized in as much as the uh, sodium to potassium ratio in your diet could affect those parameters. So I'm not saying that your bone health will be great. I'm just saying that if, uh, if your blood pressure is fantastic on your current sodium to potassium ratio, you've probably done all you can do to optimize that ratio for your bone health and your kidney health. So, uh, I will come to the live chat soon, but I want to come back to, um, what one thing that Mike had said. So one thing that Mike had said was, uh, I'm trying to figure out why my di diastolic reading is low. I read that too much salt can decrease the elasticity of your blood vessels. So I've been trying to lower my very high salt intake to see if it changes. What's concerning is now my systolic uh, is number is lowered as a result. Um, so what I would say to that um, is I wouldn't worry about the theoretical risk on the elasticity of the blood vessels. If you're chronically hypertensive, you are going to damage uh, the elasticity of your blood vessels. And uh, I think blood pressure should just be the end point that you look at. And I think that makes everything much more simpler because it's very easy to measure your blood pressure at home. And it's very easy to do self experiments on the effect of diet on your blood pressure. Uh, the effect of diet on your blood pressure should be acute. Um, and so it's actually really, you know, it's very, it would be very doable to do a randomized control trial on yourself picking uh, several different dietary modifications, repeating them uh, over and over again in a randomized fashion, and looking at the uh, effect on your postprandial blood pressure over the course of two to three hours, uh, you could do, you know, if you eat three meals a day, you can do uh, seven, you can do 21 experiments a, a week. Um, and then you can pick from that, from the acute effect, then you can start doing longer experiments. Like if I model my diet for a week or two on this, what's the chronic effect on my blood pressure? So I think it's so easy to test at home that uh, rather than being concerned about theoretical risks on elasticity, I think just measure your blood pressure. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to go to the comments now. Um, Betty K. Ramos says, we just watched a video where goats follow their mother up a cliff to get to a salt lick. Um, absolutely. So one of the things that I that I will have in my book and that I actually have in the current uh, free vitamins and minerals 101 class is um, natural examples of natural salt licks. Actually, I think there's a Wikipedia page on this. Um, but, uh, let me see if I can pull it up. So, uh, wild animals that have been observed going to salt licks include moose, elephants, tapirs. I don't even know what those are. Woodchucks, fox, squirrels, mountain goats, and porcupines. Um, so it's totally natural to add salt to your food. Oh, you know, one point that I want to make that I totally forgot about before is, uh, in studies of where people get their salt, um, let me pull up, pull up my notes on this. Um, uh, I think it's over here. So uh, if you look at... Um, if you look at where people are getting their salt from, one of the studies that was cited in the uh, most recent DRIs showed that 77% of salt intake comes from processed foods. 11.6% comes from natural foods. 6.2% is added, 5.1% uh, is added during cooking. 0.1% comes from water. And 6.2% is added at the table. So when you think about that, you know, if you're going to reduce your sodium intakes in these trials, you know, the only way to go on a low sodium diet is to cut out processed foods. So I, that strikes me as a uh, granted, you know, the salt to potassium ratio does impact hypertension. That is important heart disease risk. Um, but that's an important confounder. So, uh, Mars Bell says, what do you think about Celtic sea salt and microplastics? I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with, I, well, not, not that I'm not familiar. I'm familiar with the microplastics concern, uh, but I haven't done enough of my own research to be able to answer that question right now. Mata Shah says sodium potassium pump. Okay, well, I know that's not a question, but I just want to take that opportunity um, to to just go through the things that sodium does. Um, so I actually collected for the book that I'm working on, um, I actually collected all the known roles of sodium in the body. And so I think one way to one way to think about this is that sodium is basically the most common second layer energy currency. Um, so ATP is the primary energy currency. Sodium is a way of translating the energy from ATP to do work. And um, sorry to borrow uh, this analogy from a totally different field, um, but you know if you're familiar with Bitcoin. Uh, ATP is like if ATP is Bitcoin, sodium is like the Lightning Network. It's the second layer of energy. It's a second layer where the energy from ATP is translated during uh, the course of uh, doing work. And so, to quantify that, about twenty to forty percent of energy um, of ATP energy per day is thought to be spent on the sodium potassium pump, which is literally translating the energy from ATP into potential energy in a stored sodium gradient, as well as an adjunct stored potassium gradient. And so it's sort of like, um, to use another analogy, it's sort of like uh, creating a, a water turbine, I guess. If you're going to, um, uh, it, yeah, it's kind of like that. So if you're going to sort of hold water, um, in a high place with a dam so that you can open the dam and the water can flow through. And then that water uh, is now releasing its potential energy when it's stored in a high place into kinetic energy as it comes through. And then that can be translated into electrical energy. Uh, ATP is basically, basically pumping sodium all onto one side of the membrane so that when the sodium falls through the membrane, um, you know, sodium being on one side of the membrane is potential energy and the sodium comes through the me membrane and that's translated into kinetic energy, and then that can be translated into doing work in some other fashion. And so what kinds of work are done with the sodium gradient? Um, it's, it's truly incredible. So 
um, among the many roles of sodium, sodium is needed for the enzyme that breaks down collagen. So you cannot turn over your collagen without sodium. Uh, sodium is needed to transport many things into the body for dietary absorption. So sodium is needed to transport vitamin C. Sodium is needed to transport glucose. You know, this is why on low sodium diets, you get diarrhea. If you can't transport glucose in your gut, you will have diarrhea. And that's why like salt and rice <laughs> have been a, um, a traditional remedy for diarrhea in medicine. Sodium is needed for the sodium uh, dependent multivitamin transporter. And that transport bi transports biotin, pantothenic acid, and lipoate. And uh, research is controversial, but sodium might be needed to absorb niacin. So right here, you have vitamin C, glucose, biotin, pantothenic acid, lipoic acid, and possibly niacin that, are, that sodium is used to absorb from your diet into your body. Um, there's other research showing that sodium is needed to absorb magnesium in the gut. It's also uh, needed... Uh, to some degree to absorb iodine in the gut, and it's needed to absorb hydrogen ions, chloride, potassium, and bicarbonate in the gut. So an awful lot of stuff will not even get into your body unless you have enough sodium. But once things are in your body, sodium is, tr is transporting all kinds of other stuff inside the body. So magnesium, in addition to being absorbed in the gut, it's also sodium is needed to retain it in the kidney, and it's needed to get magnesium into cells. So if your serum magnesium is high and your red blood cell magnesium is low, sodium, you might need more sodium. Um, sodium is needed to get iodide into the thyroid follicle where thyroid hormone is, is, uh, is made. And it's needed to get iodine into the lactating mammary gland. So it's needed to transport iodine from the mother to the baby during nursing. Um, and it's needed, to, uh, it's needed to transport lots of neurotransmitters. So sodium is needed to transport glutamate. It's needed to transport glycine, GABA, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, creatine, taurine, betaine, um, and a bunch of amino acids. Uh, in the gut, um, and I, in addition to the, the nutrients that I mentioned er earlier, in the gut, uh, you also need sodium to absorb any amino acid um, that is not negatively charged. And... Um, as well as proline and all neutral amino acids. So the majority of amino acids are to, to some degree relying on sodium transport uh, in the gut. But in the brain, I mean, just think about this. If you, if you can't control the amount of glutamate, glycine, GABA, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, um, and some of these other ones in your synapse, then your neurotransmitter function is going to be completely screwed up. Um, sodium is also needed to uh, transport calcium in many cells. It's needed for a whole family of sodium hydrogen ion exchangers, which regulate acidity and alkalinity. And these are controlling, um, these are controlling uh, your saliva, various compartments, um, uh, stomach acid secretion, uh, all kinds of things. Um, but, you know, sometimes sodium is going to have an acidifying effect. Some, sometimes it's going to have an alkalinizing effect. But you can't control your acid-base balance if you don't have enough sodium. Uh, it's needed for bile salt transport. And so uh, that's um, indirectly necessary for fat absorption. It's needed for the transport of any steroid hormones that have, that have been sulfated. It's needed to uh, transport steroids. Uh, steroid hormones that haven't been sulfated, sulfated either, thyroid hormones, lots of drugs, and any bioconjugated drugs. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, many organic acids, so citrate, succinate, malate, alpha-ketoglutarate, oxaloacetate, glutarate, adipate, um, lots of different things, um, possibly glutathione in the eye and the kidney. Uh, sulfate transport in the intestine and kidney. Uh, anyway, the list just goes on and on and on. So if you're, you know, no wonder that you might feel fatigued or weak or get diarrhea if your neurotransmitters can't function correctly, if you can't absorb nutrients from your gut, and if you can't transport all these different things in the body. So I, that's not the complete list, but uh, it's it's the the chunk of stuff on there. Okay. So Mata Shah says, how many teaspoons a day? Um, well, let's see. 
uh, grams per teaspoon salt. Uh, about six grams of salt in a teaspoon, but that's not sodium. So um, I just, I believe the, the ratio is 2.5, but I'm going to Google sodium molar mass and sodium chloride molar mass. Uh, molar mass is not technically accurate here, but it comes up on Google anyway. Um, so uh, 100 gram. oh, here we go. 100 grams of sodium chloride is 39.34 grams sodium and 60.66 grams chloride. Um, so we can just multiply by 3.9, uh, excuse me, by 0.3934. Um, so in a teaspoon, there is six grams of sodium and six times Point three nine three four is uh, two point three six grams of sodium per teaspoon. Uh, oh, so the question was how many teaspoons a day? Well, that depends on what you're trying what you're trying to get. So if you're to get fifteen hundred milligrams, uh, so basically two point three grams of sodium um, per teaspoon. So if we want to see. Uh, we divide that into fifteen. Am I doing this right? Um, one second. Oh, I know what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> Using different units. Um, So if you want 1.5 grams of sodium, which would be the adequate intake, then that would be 0.63 teaspoons. If you wanted the population mean uh, or median rather of 3,000 milligrams, that would be 1.27 teaspoons. And if you wanted to hit um, five five grams, which is what uh, some people are, are recommending, that'd be 2.1 teaspoons. Um, so depending on what you're trying to hit, that's that. Uh, Ferdinand Svella says, any concerns with using sodium bicarb to get sodium? Um, well, I mean, the main concern would be if you're taking it with a meal, the bicarb, you know, might alkalinize your stomach too much. Um, and then uh, the, I guess the other concern would be at some point, you could alkalinize certain tissues if you really overdo it, um, and that can mess with your electrolytes uh, and you know p potentially uh, alter the risk of certain of like fungal infections, for example. So I, I wouldn't want to take bicarb to get your urine pH over seven. Uh, I guess would be the limit on that. And then, um, and then you know if you take too much bicarb, it will cause diarrhea. So that's part of the problem too. Taylor Brooks says, I ran across a paper talking about how chloride might be much more influential than sodium when it comes to blood pressure. Have you read anything about this? Well, sodium and chloride are partners. And I don't think chloride is much more influential, but it's it's roughly half the uh, the influence on blood pressure. Um, so I, I, you know, I think I don't in, in this sense, I think it just makes more sense to talk about salt. And you have to talk about chloride when you start talking about you know, using salt substitutes like potassium chloride, because then you're dealing with the fact that half of this is potassium, but half of it is the other half of salt. Um, and so I don't really like potassium chloride. I see no point in it except as a salt substitute, but it's not a very good salt, salt substitute. It's good for taste, but it's not very good physiologically as a salt substitute because chloride is basically doing what sodium does. Uh, so I think it's much better to think of, about sodium and chloride as partners that have to be balanced with potassium. And sodium, you know, the gist of the effect of blood pressure is salt uh, hydrates the outside of your cells, potassium hydrates the inside of your cells, um, and they need to be balanced together to appropriately control their excretion in the kidney. And so if you have too much salt rather relative to potassium, you're going to, you're going to hydrate the outside of your cells too much. And that's extracellular fluid, which includes blood. And as the blood volume expands, it puts more pressure against the uh, walls of the blood vessels. 
Um, so if you're getting salt, uh, whether it's sodium or chloride, you're going to raise extracellular water. You need potassium to counteract that and to spread the water around, both drawing it into your cells to hydrate the insides of your cells and to help you get rid of excess in the kidneys. Chris Sabin says, my EGFR is moderately low, which I believe is a cause of my high blood pressure. However, my doctor said to limit potassium because it can be hard in the kidneys. So it sounds like a catch-22. Um, yeah, I think if you have poor kidney function, it can be hard. Uh, it's not that potassium is hard on the kidneys. It's that you can get hyperkalemia if your kidney function is poor and you supplement with too much potassium. Um, I think the solution to that is to get potassium from food because potassium in food is absorbed very slowly into your bloodstream and it's less of a tax on the kidneys. Um, so if you can focus on getting potassium from food rather than supplements, then I think that's the best thing. And work with your doctor to try to test, you know, get a, a metabolic panel on different diets and, you know, make sure that you're not getting any signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia. So the ones you'd notice at home most uh, would be uh, fast heart rate or uh, heart palpitations or tingling in your hands and feet. Um, so certainly cut back and tell your doctor about it if you experience anything like that. I'm not a medical doctor, not medical advice, but on a purely educational level, uh, what I would do in that situation is you know, try to beef up the potassium in my diet. Don't take potassium supplements. Work with my doctor to run regular metabolic panels. Make sure I'm not going hyperkalemic and be very careful about the sim symptoms of hyperkalemia you could observe at home, especially fast heart rate, heart palpitations, and any kind, any kind of uh, tingling in the extremities. Rui X says, how to balance sodium to prevent excessive water retention. Um, same thing as blood pressure. Blood pressure, the salt-sensitive hypertension is the effect of sodium on excessive water retention. And yes, there are other factors that can determine whether you're retaining that water in the form of edema in your face or your legs uh, versus high blood pressure. But the principle is the same, which is that uh, you need more potassium in order to uh, bring that water into your cells and help handle it correctly in the kidneys. Um, Rui X also says, should should be absorbed with another micronutrient. Well, sodium is co-absorbed with all kinds of nutrients in the diet. And so if it's naturally present in the food or if it's mixed into your food, that's the best way to get it in. Scott Trahan says, how much salt does one need during a three-day water fast? Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm not, I haven't, uh, that's a little bit outside my wheelhouse. I haven't done any research into the specific salt requirements on a water fast. Um, so I can't answer that right now. Um, Bruce says, does drinking filtered water, both particulate and carbon filter, cause you to be at risk of developing deficiencies in trace... A little bit off topic for that, uh, Bruce. Sorry, I'm going to skip that one right now. Um, Madha Shah says, why would people retain sodium even on a low-sodium diet? Well, um, that's also regulated by hormones. So if your aldosterone is high uh, or aldosterone is high, that is one reason. Uh, pr common reason for that in women would be that progesterone is not being cleared and it's spilling over into aldosterone. Um, and so, I, yeah, I would look at your progesterone levels and your aldosterone levels and look at whether it correlates with your menstrual cycle. Um, Grant B says, what's the optimal ratio of sodium versus potassium versus magnesium? What are the best sources of each? Uh, for sources, uh, see my Vitamins and Minerals 101 course. It's free and it goes into great detail into sources. Um, very briefly on salt, the uh, best source of salt is uh, salt. Is salt. <laughs> uh, it's much easier to add salt to your food than to um, try to manipulate naturally, naturally occurring sources of salt. Uh, and I would make the point that you know if you cut out processed foods, you're cutting out 71% of your salt intake or more. Um, and so if you are going on a whole food diet, it becomes very important. If you're, if you're on a strictly whole food diet, excluding even, uh, processed foods like bread and cheese, which are considered processed, but not ultra processed, 
Uh, if you're not eating bread and cheese, so if you're eating like a grain-free, dairy-free, whole food, exclusively whole food diet, you are probably not getting enough salt and you should be thinking about adding salt to your food. Uh, potassium, on the other hand, I can say generally anything that is high in starch or high in fat or refined is going to be a relatively poor source of potassium. The best source is, uh, and, and for animal foods, um, you want to consume the fluid. So if you're cooking meat and you're throwing away the fluids, you are losing a lot of potassium in that meat. So uh, lean meats, which are low in fat, are going to have the highest amount of potassium. And if they're cooked in their juices and the juices are consumed, they're a very good source of potassium. Uh, eggs are a very good source of potassium. Milk is a good source of potassium. But uh, you know, I'm not an advocate of low-fat milk, but if you're specifically trying to target potassium, you will get more potassium from low-fat milk than from full-fat milk simply because fat is not a good source of potassium. Fruits and vegetables are a great source of potassium. Um, and then among starches, uh, legumes and starchy tubers are good sources of potassium. Grains are not such a great source, uh, but refined grains are totally empty of potassium. Refined sugar is totally empty of potassium. Um, Deborah Kerr says, how can you counteract salt if you've had too much? Um, probably eating a bunch of potassium will probably help. Mars Bell says, why do we need more than the obligatory sodium urine loss? I believe it's 230 milligrams. Um, well, first of all, this was one of the things that was considered in the DRI. And one of the pieces of evidence that they used to set the AI for sodium at 1500 milligrams was the fact that um, there was no evidence that people were use, losing more sodium in their urine. Um, so let me see if I can uh, pull up this in my notes real quick. Um, okay, so when they set the chronic, uh, the CDR, CDRR for sodium uh, at... 2300 milligrams or below um they looked at balance studies in the low uh they well they used the mean intakes in sodium in the low sodium arms of sodium reduction trials for the number but they used uh balance studies to show that that wouldn't lead to a negative sodium balance and so um So the best the best balance study that they looked at showed that a neutral balance at 1,525 milligrams per day with heat stress um, and a positive balance with no heat stress on that amount was used to support that there would be no negative balance, meaning you wouldn't pee out more than you or you wouldn't lose more than you would con consume um, on a, a diet that was below, uh, that was between 1500 milligrams and 2300 milligrams per day. Um, and so, uh, but losses, losses are highly dependent on other factors, right? And so one of the, one of the things that I think is overlooked in the sodium AI is that, um, is that they, uh, they say directly in the report that the sodium AI only applies to those, quote, at normal ambient temperatures and not engaged in high intensity physical activity. They go on for individuals at high ambient temperature and or performing high intensity physical activity, a higher sodium intake level than the AI may be needed, but such a level could not be estimated at this time. So they don't define high intensity and they don't define normal ambient temperature and they say that they can't come up with the number, but you just might need more. <laughs> so first of all, the losses can be a lot higher than that under high uh, high temperature or under high uh, physical intensity um, conditions where you're sweating a lot. Um, you know, urine is one way you lose sodium, but you lose sodium elsewhere, including uh, your sweat, especially. Um, but balance studies uh are not the right studies to use unless you have nothing else so um the reason is that your the kinetics of something meaning how fast does it turn over where does it go 
um, is altered based on the supply of something. And that's, it's sort of like, um, you know, your supply of money uh, alters how you spend your money. This, I think there's a very intuitive way to understand it. It's, you know, it's sort of like if you, if you made a budget in uh, when you were, when you were in college and then you said, my spending is X. And then um, 20 years later, you look at your income and you say, well, I defined my spending when I was in college um, and my income, you know, I have no reason to earn any more than uh, what I would need to maintain balance with the income that I, with the, the expenditures that I had previously determined. That, that's obviously silly. Why is that silly? Well, you might have kids. You might live in a better apartment. You might want to buy a house. You might want to buy a car. Um, your spending changes. But also, you know, if if all of a sudden you get a raise, um, it would also be silly to just assume that your spending stays the same without actually looking at your spending. Because if you have more money in your wallet, you're probably going to do different things with it. Uh, you're probably not going to buy a house if you don't have the money for a house. You're probably not going to buy a car if you don't have the money to buy a car. You're also probably going to be more conservative about what, you know, do, do you buy Starbucks every day, depending on the money you have. Um, so it's the same thing with sodium. Like the things you do with sodium will be altered according to the supply of sodium. And so the right metric is not balanced. Uh, you know, at a minimum, you don't want to go into negative balance. But that's not saying that balance is optimal. What's optimal is not having any of the side effects of a low sodium diet such as fatigue, diarrhea, disease, uh, dizziness, weakness. Um, and conversely, uh, you don't want to have headaches. You don't want to have high blood pressure either, right? So those health endpoints are what the study should test, not the, not the balance. And certainly not urinary sodium loss. Urinary sodium loss is totally irrelevant, except that it is a component of the overall net loss. Uh, but, you, you know, intake should be measured again balance is achieved by all the intake being balanced with the loss but urinary loss is only one component of that so there's no particular reason that urinary loss would be a figure even in balance let alone what the optimal intake is um What the says there are yogic practices involving drinking strong saline uh, water and allowing it to flow through is digesting a limiting fact digestion a limiting factor or could this result in some acute problem? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're saying. I guess if if you drank strong saline water and uh, it was beyond your capacity to absorb it, you're probably going to get diarrhea. And diarrhea once is probably not too bad of a problem, but if it's chronic, it will create deficiencies of all kinds of things. So I think that's highly dependent on how much you're drinking, whether it's causing diarrhea and how often it's done. Um, Dwayne says, any truth that you can benefit from over trace mineral, over 60 trace minerals in Himalayan salt? Um, I mean, that depends on the rest of your diet. So yeah, I mean, if you compare it to sodium chloride table salt that has no uh, trace minerals in it, then you know, you're know you less likely to be deficient in those trace minerals. Um, but how important they are is going to depend on whether your diet would have been deficient in those trace minerals anyway. So it's like any other food, it's contextual on the rest of the diet. But um, you know, so yeah, there may be some benefit, but it's going to depend on that context. Um, What do you think, Mars says, what do you think of drinking small amounts of water diluted with fresh water? Apparently it was used DIY makeshift transfusion in the past. I'm not sure what you mean. Apparently diluted water, quinton water was used as a DI. I don't, yeah, I don't know anything about it. Um, oh, diluted seawater. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know anything about using it as a makeshift transfusion. Um but, you know, you're going to get things in there. I don't see why it would be different than adding, like, sea salt. Um, but, you know, so it's probably a good source of certain trace minerals. Um, if Fred Smith, and this is the last question, I got to go. If you do a low-fat diet, you should do a low-salt diet, right? High-fat equals higher salt. Uh, no, they have nothing to do with each other. Um, 
yeah, nothing to do with each other. Um, okay, that's all for now. I got to go, but thank you for coming. It was great to be here, and I'll ho hopefully I can do this tomorrow too.